Previously, we worked on setting up validation of our form. Although it worked, it was a bit tedious because we had to write a great big class to inspect the object and reject it if it wasn't in good shape. In this chapter, we're going to look at what the Java industry standard JSR 303 is. It's a daft name, but a great idea. We'll see that JSR 303 means validating by declaring using annotations. When you're using JSR 303, you get a set of validations already coded for you. But what if you want to do something specific to your requirements like our ISBN check? Well, we'll finish the chapter by creating our own validation annotations. Now the problem with the programmatic approach we've just seen is that it's really tedious. We had to write a brand new class, that was the validator, and we had to work really hard to check that every field was filled in. It does work, but it could be better. Now the modern approach, supported from Spring 3 onwards, is to use annotations to define the validity rules. And these annotations aren't even invented by Spring. They're defined by a Java standard called, unromantically, JSR 303. It makes sense for this approach to be a standard rather than defined just by Spring, because really we're going to do exactly this same kind of work in lots of other frameworks as well. So let's see how it works. I'm going to start by undoing the work we did a few moments ago with our manual validation. So here's my create book controller from before. And the first thing I'm going to do is remove the book validator from this class. The book validator is no longer needed because as you're going to see, the work of that validator is now going to be done at least semi-automatically. I'll also need to remove the call, the rather tedious call to the validate method in my processing of the form. By the way, I could also completely delete the book validator class. It really is now completely redundant, but I'm actually going to leave it in the workspace just so that you have it in your downloadable code as a reference, if you do want to do the manual approach. The first task to make declarative validation work is really unpleasant, but it is a one-off piece of work. We need to add in the MVC annotation driven directive to your web application wiring file. Well, I think by now in your spring career, you will have done this kind of thing before. And you'll know that we have to modify the schema declarations at the top of the XML file. And that's going to involve adding the following three lines to your spring wiring file. Let's go into Eclipse and do just that. Well, here's our dispatcherservlet.xml file. As we've built it up so far on the course, we already have a few schema declarations in there. So I need to add in the MVC schema namespaces. Now, as always, I'd recommend that instead of trying to type this in for yourself, always go across to the Spring Framework documentation reference link and follow the link to the reference manual in HTML. And I think probably the best thing to do here would be to do a control F or similar for MVC colon annotation driven. And there it is at the time of recording, it's at section 15.12.1 in the manual. As you can see there, there's a very useful example for your XML schema declaration. We're going to need this line here and we'll just transfer that in can go anywhere in the list of XML namespaces at the top. And then we need to add in the schema location references. That's those two lines here into the existing string. This is all one big long string. I think we've done that before on the course, but I always like to go through that in detail because it does cause an awful lot of problems. So that's the worst of the whole process out of the way. We now just need to, as on the caption, add on the MVC colon annotation driven directive into the XML. 
And what this directive does is it tells Spring that once the Spring container has been created, Spring needs to look at all of the beans it's configured and look for any references to the JSR 303 annotations. Let's go back to our controller. And the big difference in declarative validation is we no longer need to manually call a validate method. All we need to do is at the point where we're passing in the reference to the book, we add in the at valid annotation. Now, as always, I'll need to import that. And let's very carefully look at where the import comes from. So I've done my usual control shift and O to automatically import an Eclipse. And just check out the import at the top of the file there. This import comes from the standard Java X package. Now that import was successful because I have two jar files in my lib directory. And by the way, they've been in your lib directory as well throughout the course so far. We just haven't needed them. And the jar files are the hibernate validator jar file and the validation API jar file. These two jar files together form an implementation of JSR 303. And just by having them in the lib directory, they get picked up and configured by Spring. So just to recap, by adding the at valid annotation to the point where we pass in the book object, Spring knows to apply the validation rules to this particular object. So that's OK. But how do we actually define our validation rules? Well, that's easy as well, as long as you don't mind adding annotations to your domain class. Now, this caption shows an example of how to use the JSR 303 annotations. The not empty annotation tells Spring that, well, this attribute must not be empty after it's done the binding, whilst the min annotation tell Spring that this attribute must have a minimum value, in this case, zero. Now, these annotations, as often is the case with annotations, don't affect the usual operation of this particular class. If I were to instantiate the class manually, then the annotations will be ignored, so I can still do unit testing. These annotations are only read and processed by Spring when Spring is converting the form into a Java object. So a very easy job to add in our standard validation rules. Let's get back into Eclipse and get them added. So we'll find our book class. And on the face of it, this is a very, very simple job of just adding those four annotations, not empty to the ISBN and not empty to the title and not empty to the author. And we were using the min value equals zero for the price. There is one slight complexity here. When I do the automatic imports with the control shift O and we have a look at what's been imported, you can see there that the min annotation has indeed come from the standard Java validation package. Whilst rather confusingly, the not empty annotation has come from the org.hibernate.validator package. Now, it's quite a long story, but basically, the hibernate validator is in fact just a working implementation of JSR 303. As often is the case with Java, the idea is that other people could produce their own working implementations of JSR 303. But rather annoyingly, in the standard set of annotations, there is no not empty annotation. There is a not null, and I'll just import that to prove that it's there. In fact, there it is, the Javax validation not null. But not null doesn't work in a web application because when Spring does the binding, even if the field is blank, there will still be an empty string created for that field. And therefore, if we use not null, the validation will always pass, even if the field is blank. So we need to use not empty. And the way not empty works is that is a null 
or a completely blank string. And basically, Hibernate 